Hello, hello. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast. This is James Lindsay, and we're going to talk, we're going to kind of start a lot of podcasts. I think we'll see how, how this goes, but I'm intending to do a lot of podcasts on what is known as the critical turn in education. And so just to kind of lay out my intentions, uh, I know that I'm pretty widely considered to be kind of a go-to guy on critical race theory now. I'm frankly a bit bored with critical race theory. I think I've said what needs to be said about it. But um, my goal with doing this a podcast series on the critical turn in education, which I'll kind of elaborate on as, as we get going further, is not to become the go-to guy on critical pedagogy and what's happened in education. Happy to help people with that, but my goal is actually to offer the ground level information people need to understand the theory behind where and how the critical theory shift in education has occurred. It's a, it's an older and longer story than people realize, but I'm going to, you know, I've used the metaphor when I've discussed this kind of series that I'm thinking of uh, doing here. I've discussed this, I've used the metaphor of the, the Pluto flyby. If you recall, when we sent that spacecraft by Pluto. It didn't stop. It didn't even go into orbit around Pluto, right? It shot right by, took some great pictures, uh, gave everybody a lot of new insight about what Pluto is like and what it looks like. And then it just kept going. And that's sort of my intention. I don't think I'm going to get pulled into the gravitational pull of the critical pedagogy movement. There are a lot of people, this is really a parent's fight, um, there are a lot of people involved in this already who are very, very effective, and I want to just offer them tools that is going to that, that will help them understand what has happened to our education system, the fact that it has become l- quite literally through this critical turn in education a kind of Marxist uh, institution within the country or countries throughout Western civilization, but particularly in North America. Uh, United States and Canada being kind of the epicenter of that. And I just kind of want to inform people about it. There have already been a few uh, podcasts that I've done here on the New Discourses podcast about critical education. Uh, Obviously, a lot of people will be thinking of my recent mini series. It was just two podcasts about groomer schools where I'm talking about kind of the very uh, most recent edge. Uh, the groomer schools one actually gives a little bit of contextual history. And I talk about the cultural Marxists approach where Gramsci wanted to infiltrate and take over education. George Lukács became kind of the deputy commissar of education, um, in the Hungarian revolution and implemented a, uh, rampant sex ed program that mir- mirrors the kind of grooming stuff that's going on in the schools now. So the focus there, of course, though, was this kind of very pornographic, very sex and gender and sexual identity obsessed program, a lot of it being done through the social emotional learning branding, SEL branding. Uh, And then the second of those podcasts actually details an actual paper in queer theory trying to intervene upon early childhood education. Uh, So that's kind of the the. A picture of what's happening now with some of its historical background, but this is going to be a kind of finer grained. I'm not going to talk in big sweeping themes necessarily. I will probably hit upon Gramsci. I will probably hit upon Lukács and some of these other theorists. Marcusa is almost definitely going to make an appearance. I know he'll make an appearance at some point when we get to one of these guys down the road called Henry Giroux, um, who is a big fan of Marcusa, but, um, and Gramsci, as a matter of fact, uh, and Gramsci will make an appearance when we talk about Paulo Freire before that. But what I'm actually going to do is I want to just kind of give this survey that it's going to extend roughly back to just to put a kind of fake bookmark 1970. Uh, so 50 years ago, or plus or minus a handful of years, um, is when the critical in turn and the critical turn in education really began. And so there's this book actually called The Critical Turn in Education that's written by a guy named Isaac Gottsman. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce his last name, G-O-T-T-E-S-M-A-N, Gottsman. Um, and the subtitle of this book kind of tells you the whole thing, that this thing occurred in three stages, a critical turn in education, meaning our switching our education system from a kind of liberal education system to a critical theory-based education system. Critical pedagogy is the formal name for that. 
uh, pedagogy is a theory of education. Uh, the subtitle of this book tells you that it happened in three stages, from Marxist critique to post-structuralist feminism to critical theories of race. And so you can see Gottsman's laying out that we've had kind of three major distinct phases where our education system was taken from a broadly liberal and classical education in the United States and Canada um, into A, Marxist critique, B, that gets modified later by the post-structuralist feminists. That's um, where the queer theory stuff is really going to make its way in, by the way. Uh, Post-structuralist is, well, for, for simplicity at the moment, I'm just going to say that's a kind of fundamental branch of postmodern theory. So this is where postmodernism came into the picture. And then in the third phase, critical theories of race, which he documents as being in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And so we're looking at the 70s first with the Marxist critique. By the 80s and early 90s, we're looking at post-structuralist feminism making their way in. And then this all goes intersectional through critical theory of race. In other words, critical race theory by the late 90s and early 2000s. And our education system basically, since I'll just bookmark again a random kind of page marker year, 2005 to 8 or thereabouts, Joe Kinchelo being kind of relevant particularly then, uh, has really been already transformed. It's already undergone the critical turn in education that we're now going to track. So th my goal with this series to kind of introduce it is that I'm going to read through, I'm not going to read this whole book into the uh, microphone like I've done with some of Marcuse's essays. It's obviously a bit long for that, and that's not the goal. What I want to actually do, I am going to read in this episode and the next the beginning part of this book to frame out what's going on. But after that, what I want to do is I want to go kind of through chapter by chapter. So the Marxist critique parts, and then I want to dive off of Gottsman and talk about the books that he's chronicling as being critical to the critical turn in education. Uh, so, you know, he's going to talk about Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So we're going to do a little bit of critical turn in education introduction. Then we're going to take a, a sidebar. What is actually the Pedagogy of the Oppressed? What was Paulo Freire's argument? Where, what did Marxist education theory look like in the late 60s and early 70s as this kind of titan of education? He's kind of, the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is, is Freire's most famous work, is considered kind of like this super scriptural tome in virtually every education school in North America now. It, it, how this happened is an interesting story. We're going to have to kind of peel back the layers because it never should have been. It never, ever, ever should have been. It's blatantly Marxist. It praises Lenin, blah, blah, blah. It never should have been ex accepted by by North American educators, but it did make its way in. And understanding that this you know insidious creep into the education system has been going on since the late 60s and early 1970s is crucial to understanding that. And then, you know, in the next chapter, Gottsman discusses a couple of other people, Bowles and Gintis, who you've probably not heard of. We're going to have uh, a few other big characters, Michael Apple. Eventually, we're going to get to uh, Henry Giroux. And he's this kind of very pivotal figure. I would actually argue, and I think Gottsman argues, he's really the father of the critical pedagogy movement. He's really the marker of the critical turn in education. He's really responsible for bringing Ferrari into the North American education system, despite this earlier work in Marxist critique from the 70s. And, and Giroux is a very interesting figure because he's a very um, pragmatic activist. His goal is to transform education, and he draws from just about everywhere. But in particular, he starts bringing in the European theorists, where it was very kind of Marxist in a kind of North American Marxist frame. You had Ferrari doing his thing as very uh, South American Marxist. He's Brazilian. Um, you, you, you had that happening, but the influence was pretty low on education. And Ferrari, or the, then Giroux comes along, that's G I R. O-U-X, if you want to look up Henry Giroux, comes along and he's drawing from the European theorists. So he draws heavily from Marcuse. He mentions Horkheimer. He cites Adorno. He cites Derrida. And he talks about Foucault. And he so he's pulling. So you start to look at that fusion of, of critical theory and um, postmodernism. And, you know, in previous podcasts here, I highlight Kimberly Crenshaw and give her probably more credit than she deserves by saying she was the forger of the one ring. The one ring's really intersectionality, but um, 
I say that she is she marks the fusion of postmodernism and neo-Marxism. But where that really happened was through people like Henry Drew in education starting in 1979, 80, 81, when he was publishing his first big books. And so he's bringing Ferrari to the table. He's bringing Marcuse to the table. He's bringing the postmodernists to the table, Derrida and, and Foucault in particular, with the purpose of remaking education for his radical vision. And so he becomes very instrumental in forming the kind of raw material from which that one ring is going to be forged. So he's a big character. So we'll dive into some of his stuff and then we'll go forward into the relevance of post-structural feminism and critical theories of race and kind of round out this discussion on the critical turn in education and what critical pedagogy is. I want everybody in the world to be as comfortable throwing around the term critical pedagogy as they have become throwing around the term critical race theory. Critical pedagogy is the same thing. If we had, if if we were using more plain language, we would call it critical education theory. You'd be perfectly comfortable with that. The fancy word for that is pedagogy. So critical pedagogy needs to become as comfortable a term as critical race theory. And if not, we can use critical education theory. That's fine too, especially since they don't own that term. But What's kind of crucial off the title of this book and this progression, I don't know how many episodes this series will have. It might end up having a lot. Um, it might end up having a few. It's probably going to take me several months to get through it, and I'll dip in and out and do other podcasts. I've got some Marcusa stuff I still want to bring out. But that's kind of the vision. I don't know for sure how big it'll be and how long it'll take, but we're going to explore the critical turn in education. And the thing I, another thing I need people to take away from this is that there has been a critical turn in education. In other words, there's been a deliberate shifting from the classical and liberal education model that the United States has depended on from when Thomas Jefferson was saying that we needed public education to the critical theory co-optation of that. And so when people say that we need to get rid of public education in the United States to solve this problem, I mean, that might help. It might work. I don't know. It's I don't think it's realistic. What we have to realize is that our education system has been co-opted and redefined by so-called reformers who are actually Marxists, who are not reformers at all, who took over the education system. And so there is actually an answer. What does it look like? What does education look like? Going back to a genuinely liberal and classical education model and then adopting some of the, you know, they're in the 60s and 70s, and I'm not expert in this enough to talk about it in detail, but I have seen it and I've, I've heard about it. There were actual theories of pedagogy, actual theories of education that were very effective, and they got kicked off to the side for this self, self-esteem based crap. And now social emotional learning is sort of the new variant of that. All this trauma informed nonsense today. It's all part of this. It's all just a manipulation off of this critical turn. So this critical turn becomes the thing that we have to understand to understand how education turned. Now, the relevance of education is extremely important. Um, it took them 50 years to do this, by the way. But the relevance of education here is very important because if we could cure every bit of the woke problem in our country right now except education, we'd be back, we'd be back in the same problems within five to ten years. It's that bad. Um, and you also have to realize that, that since they've had 50 years for this, this is a multi-generational problem. They realized in the 70s we have to start changing education, and they're going to change education at the level of the teaching colleges. So now you're going to have new teachers who are able to radicalize students, those students are going to grow up and become teachers themselves or professionals, and they're going to do another crop, and they're going to do another crop. If you read Cynical Theories, Helen and, and I talk about that process there where things just became kind of known knowns. We said that postmodernism gave way to applied postmodernism, gave way to reified postmodernism. I don't know if I would characterize it that way now, uh, the way that I did there, but at that last stage where activists applying postmodern themes very intentionally in the 90s, which was certainly happening in, in the early 2000s, um, forgot that they were applying postmodern themes in some sense and just started to take for granted. That's just what everybody knows. That's what we've always known. It's been industry standard for a long time. Ignored the fact that the industry had been co-opted, captured, and turned very intentionally beforehand. So you have this multi-generational problem where Students were getting radicalized into being teachers who then radicalized another generation of students who became teachers. And so you get three or four generations down in this, 50 years down the track. 
you get three or four generations down in this and people have completely lost track of the idea that there was ever anything else. It's just known knowns out there now. And so without too much further ado, I'm going to break into the critical turn in education. What I'm going to do in this episode is actually read the kind of preliminary information from this book, which is going to be this kind of little blurb at the beginning, uh, which is literally just a page. And then um, this this fellow, Michael Apple, who is a huge uh, education, critical education theorist, I think Michael Apple, let me double check, wrote a, f- a kind of forward. Uh, and I'm going to read through that. Uh, it's a yeah, series editor's acknowledgments or whatever. That's uh, Michael Apple is a series editor. So Michael W. Apple from University of Wisconsin at Madison. I'm going to read his foreword to this volume in what he calls the Critical Social Thought Series. Uh, and we're going to turn to, in the next episode of the Critical Pedagogy Series on the New Discourses podcast here, we're going to turn to Isaac Gotsman's introduction. And I will not bore you by slogging through chapters one, two, three, and so on, which are incredibly detailed. They're interesting. I will summarize those as we go uh, and their relevance, but I'm not going to read through the meat of the book. Now, if you want to get the book, I encourage it. It was published, I think, in 2016. I can double check that too. Uh, but it, like I said, is titled The Critical, yeah, 2016, The Critical Turn in Education from Marxist Critique to Post Structuralist Feminism to Critical Theories of Race by Isaac. Gotsman, who is at, or was at in 2016 anyway, the University of, no, sorry, at uh, Iowa State University, professor in the School of Education at Iowa State University. So without further ado then, the critical turn in education, there's this little blurb before the book. I'm, I actually want to read this because I think it's kind of telling. But we're going to see some really telling stuff about what's happened in the United States and North America in general uh, within education. And it's going to explain uh, how this all happened within um, in the new uh, book that I've written, Race Marxism, which should come out pretty soon through the New Discourses imprint when I can get it typeset and then we're ready to go. Um, I actually talk about, you know, well, you can say that these are the seeds of this or this is the soil in which it was grown. Um, Critical pedagogy is, I say in the book, the plow, the planter, and the ammonium nitrate that allows it to to flourish, the fertilizer. Um, And so it's very important that we understand that the moment in history that sucks that we've arrived at by in the woke menace largely depends upon the critical turn in education. We can easily frame that in terms of the Gramscian instruction which was taken up after it got translated into English by Joseph Buttigieg. And again, yes, that Buttigieg, Pete's dad at Notre Dame. Um, The Gramscian instruction that education is one of the key cultural pillars, maybe the most important key cultural pillar to take over. And so when when we talk about the long march to the institutions, which the uh, the Italian communist, no, German communist, Rudy Deutschke, uh, named and inspired Marcusa looking at Mao, probably reflecting off of Gramsci as well, this long march to the institutions, the first and most important institution they realized in addition to the media that they had to capture was definitely going to be education. So they could do this multi-generational transformation to prepare the soil. There's your fertilizer, your plow and your planter so that the seeds of a Marxist revolution could take place when the right moment arrived, which is now. Welcome to your cultural revolution. They've been laying the groundwork for 50 years. Thank you for uh, joining us. Keep your hands and feet inside the ride at all times. That's where we are. Uh, So I just kind of want to go through this and paint this picture. This is an extraordinarily important piece of the history, and it's very unfortunate that nobody has told this piece of the history. I meant to myself, but I've just had critical race theory absorbed all of my time, and then Marcusa absorbed all of my time for a year and a half, and I haven't been able to turn back to this. I kept hoping somebody else would do it, Um, but I'm somebody, so here we are. And let that be a lesson to all of you going forward. You're somebody too. Start picking this up and stop waiting for people like me to do it for you. We all need to pitch in on this. You can read these books yourself. That said, 
The Critical Turn in Education, meaning the book itself, it's in italics, traces the historical emergence and development of critical theories in the field of education from the introduction of Marxist and other radical social theories in the 1960s to the contemporary critical landscape. So if you aren't aware, by the way, before I continue, critical obviously means critical in the sense of critical theory, in the sense of what Gottsman we're going to see calls critical Marxism, uh, which I think is a very telling thing. I think that's going to be in the next episode primarily. I don't remember if Michael Apple talks about it in his in his foreword here. The book begins by tracing the first waves of critical scholarship in the field through a close contextual study of the intellectual and political projects of several core figures, including Paulo Freire, Samuel Bowles and Herbert Gintis, Michael Apple, and Henry Giroux. So I didn't make those names up. Later chapters offer, an, offer a discussion of feminist critiques, the influx of postmodernist and post-structuralist ideas in education, and the critical theories of race. So you're going to see that this is you, we're going to trace the history over 50 years of how we ended up with this SEL monster, social emotional learning monster, that we have now. While grounded in U.S. scholarship, the critical turn in education contextualizes the development of critical ideas and political projects within a larger international history and charts the ongoing theoretical debates that seek to explain the relationship between school and society. Today, much of the language of this critical turn has now become commonplace. Words such as hegemony, ideology, and the term critical itself. But by providing a historical analysis, the critical turn in education illuminates the complexity and nuance of these theoretical tools, which offer ways of understanding the intersections between individual identities and structural forces in an attempt to engage and overturn social injustice. So you can kind of see it's all there, right? Engage and overturn. So it's this revolutionary ideology. It's Marxist. Uh, it doesn't even hide the fact that it's Marxist. Words such as hegemony, which was kind of the big deal for Gramsci. Ideology, which was the big idea for the cultural Marxists. Uh, Lukács being significant, I think, with that. Critical, that's the Frankfurt School. So you can see that they're contextualizing this, that the cultural and uh, critical turns of Marxism of the early and middle 20th century become center pieces to how um, they're going to think about how education has to be rethought and how what they want to do is they want to explain the relationship between school and society because the Marxist view is that everything is structural, that everything within the structure reproduces the structure unless you disrupt, dismantle, subvert, deconstruct, or in other, by other means, create a revolution that throws it out and replaces it with a new program run by the critical theorists. And they have largely achieved this in education, and they must be stopped. This must be taken back from them. We must take back education. You'll notice, by the way, some of you will recall last year when the stupid two plus two equals five thing was going on. And I bet if we went onto Ed Twitter, which most of that has blocked me now, critical Ed Twitter has mostly blocked me. They used to use the hashtag within mathematics, take back math. So again, the usual projection game is being played by the critical Marxists. That game is to claim that the thing has already been taken away from them and that they're taking it back when in fact they have now colonized education and what we need to do is take it back so that we can't say we need to take back education because they've already used that idea and that term. We can use it and we will use it and we are going to take it back. But they've tried to make that impossible by claiming that they're the ones taking back education from who? Well, from the white supremacists and from the the patriarchy and every other stupid and the capitalists and every other stupid thing. That is actually their belief and why that this is necessary is that the capitalists and later the men and the, the white supremacists actually took what was a better educational model off in some historical utopia and turned it into a tool of, domi of reproducing domination throughout the modern era. 
post enlightenment. And so what they want to take it back from is the liberal model, uh, while pretending that they're creating a super liberal model, uh, for themselves, which is actually a critical model that they will have total control of why. So, and this is very important. The goal is not to indoctrinate your children. Everybody wants to believe that that's what this is about. You know, educate, don't indoctrinate nice things like that. Teach kids how to think, not what to think. It's so much worse than you think. They are not indoctrinating your children. They're not teaching them doctrine. They are installing lenses. They are teaching them how to think, how to think about everything wrongly, how to think through those theoretical lenses. They are programming your children to be critical theorists, to adopt a critical consciousness and to see the world through a critical consciousness. It's the difference between memorizing a bunch, if it were going to go in kind of the Christian religious perspective, being forced to memorize a bunch of doctrine and repeat it as though it's true whether you believe it or not, that's indoctrination. Whereas programming would be like lighting your kids on fire for Jesus, but you've, it, which is you know exciting to Christians unless you start imagining it's some weird cult that's doing it, uh, at which point every a heretical cult, all of a sudden people are like, oh no. That's the thing. It's like where they're, they're trying to teach you to see through critical theory colored glasses or teach your children to see through critical theory colored glasses to see the whole world that way, which of course makes them complainers, which makes them see, adopt an external locus of control so that they have little little um, ability to feel secure or effective in their lives, that they're depressed, they're going to be anxious as a result of this. They're not going to know who they are. They're going to be complainers like I said, complainers who aren't actually competent. They're not going to, we're going to waste all this time that they could be learning to read and they could be learning to write and they could be learning to do mathematics. They could be learning the basics of science. And instead we're going to teach them to be stupid, critical social theorists to see that's the most important thing. That's all they're going to do because they have a critical consciousness, a critical social consciousness. That's all they're allowed to think about. So it's programming them to think that way. And by the way, I got asked recently, what is the biggest tragedy of critical race theories in the, in the schools? What's the biggest problem? What's the, why so bad? And you know, you think, oh, because it's dividing by race and it teaches people to see race again and it teaches people to think it's very div divisive and it, it's child abuse. Um, you know, all of those things, but that's not it. That's not actually the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the misallocation, the misappropriate, the, the misallocation of resources, educational resources. Why are our literacy rates in the toilet? Why are math attainment so bad? Why is it that we have to have all these remedial college classes? Because largely this critical turn in education has replaced so much of what would have been robust education with terrible models, whether that's restorative justice in terms of school discipline, which makes schools terrible learning environments, uh, whether it's replacing actual curriculum with, with social theory, which is a waste of resources, a complete misallocation. It's fraud. It's a complete misallocation of resources, whether that's, um, getting into the, the, the social emotional learning side where everything's now got to be a trauma and feelings and using that to break kids down so you can reprogram them in, in the cult critical consciousness, all of those things. The biggest tragedy is that your math class is about critical race theory now instead of math. So you're losing, we talk about learning loss around the pandemic, like all that learning that could have happened that was lost. The amount of learning loss that has been in North American schools because of critical pedagogy being a focus for at least the last 40 years is astronomical. Absolutely, absolutely catastrophic. The reason that we have such a poorly educated public, relatively speaking now, uh, in terms of attainment and so on, is because we have been wasting time, especially over the last decade, teaching critical theory instead of teaching actual competence in actual subjects like mathematics, reading, science, writing, and so on. So um, let me skip down here to uh, the series editor, that's Michael Apple from University of Wisconsin-Madison, which, by the way, is also where critical race theory began. Um, quite the shame, uh, big black mark on that university, defund UW-Madison. That's also the home of the racist rock they had to move, for those of you who followed that. You know, they figured out that a race or that a rock used to be a type of a type of boulder, glacial boulder, that one happened to be on campus famously at UW Madison, uh, used to be called by a racial epithet in the 1920s and before. And so having unearthed this fact, it suddenly became that the rock 
being on campus, 42-ton Boulder, destroyed the idea of an inclusive environment on campus for racial minorities. So they spent $50,000 plus to move the rock off of campus over by the lake. And if you've heard on my only subs podcast, uh, my, my subscribers only podcast, I did a little dive into my adventure to try to find the rock when I was in Madison, um, I guess late this summer, early this fall, whatever it was. Uh, and while I did not personally find the rock, you can go listen to that exciting story about how I and my friend Brian were able to uncover the intelligence that we were able to deliver into the hands of another Wisconsinite who was able to find the rock. And I do have the address of the rock, but University of Wisconsin at Madison is really just a, it should just have a heaping pile of shame put on it. So you've got critical pedagogy being very uh, centrally driven there. And you have, um, critical race theory being developed there. You have a racist rock problem there. It's, it's such a shameful, embarrassing place. Um, everybody who has a degree from there should be should sue these critical theory idiots for making their degrees worthless and the administration that brought it all in. I don't know if you can do that. I, actually, everybody who graduated from an Ivy League should do that too. Harvard degree is flatly embarrassing at this point, but I digress. So let's read Michael Apple's introduction, because this is really telling about what the critical turn in education is about. It's kind of his summary is this guy who's put out this whole series or edited this whole series of these books. Um, very influential uh, critical pedagogist in his own right. And he says, let me begin my introduction to Isaac Gottsman's fine book with a story. During a series of lectures and some work with critical educators in a country in Asia, I spent a good deal of time with graduate students. Many of them had been or still were teachers in the public schools of that country. We talked about many things, and I was deeply impressed with their knowledge of a large array of work in critical education theory and research. During our conversations, they told me that one of the reasons they were more than a little familiar with some of the core work in critical education was because it was included on the standardized tests that teachers and graduate students had to take as an official part of their program. Now I'm going to pause. So this is really important, and you're going to see that it's very indicative of the paranoid conspiracy theory at the heart of critical theory, but also the um, relentless drive to constant revolution, to constantly being outsider, subversive, disruptive. I've done podcasts in the past. The, the, the whole point is just to break things. There's just no point. It's no, no goal to build. It's only to break, right? And so this is you're going to see this very clearly. So what we have though is that. He's he's working, um, he's working in Asia, and he's encountering these people, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we know all about critical education, critical pedagogy, because it's part of our standardized tests." So you can also see this insidious aspect of praxis, which is to include this crap as though it's standard in everything, to to worm it into the existing system so that it's kind of the background water, the way that everybody thinks about the world. But the funny part is, what we're about to see is that Michael Apple thinks that's not only good, but a problem. And of course, why? They, everything in their entire worldview is dialectical. Go back to my Hegel podcast. Go to my Mark, Marcusa podcasts. Listen, to, everything is everything is dialectical. Everything contains its own contradiction and everything's fruitful because of those contradictions can be dwelt upon and driven. That's the heart of the revolutionary program. And so what does Michael Apple say about the fact that you would think he's going to be excited that critical theory is now re and education is, re is, is is worked into the standardized test. It's something that students wanting to become teachers have to deal with. And he says this is a paradoxical situation. On the one hand, it clearly shows what Gottsman calls the critical turn in education has been integrated into the formal corpus of official programs in education throughout the world, which should horrify everybody, by the way. I am certain that this was not an easy thing to do, and it constitutes a victory. So there he is. He's happy. We're making progress. We are actually pulling off the long march. We're getting our crap into educational programs throughout the world, especially, by the way, North America. But this was in Asia. But then he goes on. On the other hand, as Jeff Witte has noted, such incorporation may also signify a process of co-optation taking insurgent knowledge and turning it into simply one more academic area that needs to be studied for examinations, thereby severing its connections to its political roots. This is something I, too, have worried about publicly 
since rather than politicizing the academic, it academ- academicizes, academicizes the political. Okay, so their goal is to politicize everything, including education. Teaching as a political act is the kind of fundamental foundational statement of critical pedagogy. Teaching or learning both is a political act. And he says, rather, once you start to make it the official part of the curriculum, which is a victory that we absolutely want, this is the critical turn in education happening, it becomes the official curriculum, but oh no. Once that happens, it severs its connections to its political roots, and instead of making academics more political, it turns the political into an academic subject that can be studied. And so you lose that revolutionary energy. Again, anything becoming stable for these fools is bad. And so here you go. And how does he characterize this? Because he loves the dialectic, because he's ultimately a Hegelian religionist, as I've tried to point out repeatedly. He says, thus, like the rest of the world we live in, critical education is caught up in the contradictory relations of power. So everything, first of all, contradictory, there's your dialectical thinking. Second of all, everything in the world is caught up in relations of power. Relations of power for these people are like pagan gods. We are the playthings of the pagan gods. For the postmodernists, they're worried about how power relations are created through discourses and language. Through the neo-Marxists, it was about how they're created through culture. And we have these power dynamics. And the woke, it's they've blended those two things together uh, dialectically. So here's all these contradictions between different relations of power. And that's how everything in the world must be thought of. So he says, like the rest of the world we live in, critical education is caught up in contradictory relations of power. But a realization of these contradictions must not cause paralysis or cynicism. It should drive us to constantly remember and reconnect with the critical impulses and commitments that have led to the critical turn in education. So everything in the world must be thought of in a way that concentrates the ideology, the critical ideology. You must understand that this is how they think, and their goal by bringing this in education is to make your children think about this or think in this way about everything. So he says, Apple says, this makes a book like The Critical Turn in Education that traces out the political and intellectual history of some of the major figures and traditions in critical education an important contribution right now. Speaking broadly, critical education seeks to expose how relations of power and inequality, social, cultural, and economic, in their myriad of forms, combinations, and complexities, are manifest and are challenged in the formal and informal education of children and adults. So that's a lot of words in a sentence, a very complicated mishmash of words. Expose how relations of power are relevant to everything is actually all it's saying, but power and inequality, and so three domains, social, cultural, and economic. So everything's all mixed together, all inter forms of, of, of inequality and oppression are interlinked. Critical race theory says that you can't understand any of them unless you understand them through race. Queer theory would say you can't understand any of them unless you understand them through sex, gender, and sexuality. Fat studies would say you can't understand any of them unless you understand them through fat. And each one of those different pieces centers the thing. And of course, critical race theory is by far the most powerful of these, so they tend to win out and everything has to be made about race. That's the point of critical race theory. But if it's Marxism, everything has to be made about economics, if it's neo-Marxism, it has to be made about the culture industry and consumerism, uh, and if it's this woke crap, it's all going to be about these factors of identity. And then he says, in their myriad of forms, combinations, and complexities. Let me just cut through all this crap. Marxists create a very complicated sounding theory that's ultimately very simple. I've said in the past that critical race theory, for example, is as broad as a great lake and as deep as a mud puddle. There's really nothing there. There's absolutely nothing there. Critical race theory, in fact, can be boiled down to a very, very simple idea. It is calling everything that you want to control racist until you control it. That's all it is. Marxism can be saying boiled down to the same idea, saying everything is classist until you control it. Everything you want to control has a classist element until you control it. You can kind of see how this is a very simple, univariate, obsessive religion in that sense. So they like to paint out, oh my God, power is so complicated. It's relational. It has so many forms and combinations, relations of power and inequality in multiple dimensions, social, cultural, economic form, all these 
combinations and complexities, and it comes up in so many different forms, and they're all interlinked. And we have to understand how those are manifest and are challenged in the formal and informal education of children and adults. It's so complicated. It's really not. It's actually very, very simple. The whole point is to teach people to be specific types of complainers about everything they want to control until they control it. That's it. That's actually all it is. It's teaching people to, to, again, a critical theory. If you recall, this is from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Entry for Critical Theory. They explain it summarizes that a critical theory reaching back to Horkheimer in 1937 has to have three elements, has to have an idealized vision for society against which it compares the existing society. It must, it must be able to articulate how the existing society fails to live up to that idealized vision of society. Secondly, and thirdly, it must inspire social activism to create change. In other words, critical theory must have a critical praxis wedded to it. Critical theory and critical praxis are two sides of the same critical Marxist coin. Theory and practice cannot be separated. That very important. So they say it's very complicated. It's actually very simple. It's teaching people to complain about specific points of agitation, the, the Marxists might call mass lines of action, where they know they can pull a lever to turn something over in society so they can attempt to get a revolution that they, on the other side of it, will be the people who are the enlightened few who get to control. That's it. It's not complicated, but then they write sentences like this that are four lines long, uh, relations of power and inequality, social, cultural, and economic, and their myriad of forms, combinations, and complexities are manifest and are challenged. So two different things happening at once in the formal and informal uh, education of children and adults. It complicated, 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 complicated. No, it's all the same crap. It's, it can all be summarized in a single sentence. Complain about everything in a specific way that you want to control until you control it absolutely. Everything. Simple as can be. So it's not even as deep as a mud puddle. It's not even as deep as a freaking teaspoon. But it is as broad as probably not even a great lake, the Pacific Ocean. It's just huge. They, they, they have it's this extremely shallow analysis that literally is meant to apply to everything. That's the entirety of this whole thing. In its most robust form, Michael Apple tells us it, meaning critical education, involves a thoroughgoing reconstruction of what education is for, how it should be carried out, what we should teach, and who should be empowered to engage in it. In other words, it's a power grab. It's a takeover. How it should be carried out? Well, of course, the critical Education theorists are going to be the only ones who actually know how it should be carried out. What we should teach, well, they're going to be the only ones who are going to be able to set the curriculum and can be trusted to do so because they're the only ones with the enlightened critical consciousness. And who should be empowered to engage in it? So, of course, they're going to pick themselves. It's just a power grab. It's all a stupid power grab dressed up as complicated and interesting theory that's actually just really shallow, bad social theory about everything. And again, the goal of bringing it in education is to fulfill Gramsci's vision that we can take over one of these key cultural pillars to produce the necessarily fertile ground through a cultural revolution, the first stages of a cultural revolution, so that they can have a Marxist revolution and seize control. That's it. What they have done in having succeeded in the critical turn in education is they have actually figured this out. They have started to reconstruct what education is for, how it should be carried out, what should be taught, and who gets to do it. And it's all critical theory, critical theory, critical theory, us. That's their answers. What's education for? Raising critical consciousness. How should it be carried out? By raising critical consciousness. What should we teach? Critical theory. Who should be engaged to, to do it or empowered to do it? us, critical theorists. That's it. This more robust understanding. So you see when they say this crap, it's hard not to laugh. This is his next sentence. This more robust understanding. It's not a robust understanding. It's clown shoes. Uh, this more robust understanding involves fundamental transformations of the underlying epistemological and ideological assumptions that are made about what counts as, quote, official or legitimate knowledge and who holds it. See? They do. The, it, everything that I've said in all of these podcasts, whether it's Marcuse, whether it's Horkheimer, whether it's Marx, whether it's Hegel, this is it. This is If you go back to Hegel, this is a shift from Verstand, which anybody has access to, to Vernunft, which only the theorists have. This is Marx's shift from uh, 
everyday man to socialist man. And socialist man has a different understanding because he understands the Marxist theory. This is a shift from traditional theory, which anybody can do. It's universal. It's accessible to anybody by definition to critical theory, which only somebody who has a second dimension of thought as Marcuse might have it has opened their minds to. So it's a fundamental transformation of the blah, 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 blah. In other words, we're in charge. Who gets to count as official or legitimate knowledge? It is wrapping all of education back into the what it would be called if it were a religion with a scripture, the intratextual fundamentalism at the heart of all critical theory. That only the Marxian theorists possess the correct understanding of the world. And so we have to transform everything, the underlying what is epistemological and ideological assumptions. What? How do we know what is true? And the answer is going to be through the ideology, but this is an iron law of woke projection. They say everybody else has an ideology, so they're overcoming ideology. But in fact, really what they're doing is wrapping everything up into the ideology that if we were Hegel, we would have called Vernunft. And if we were Horkheimer, we would have called critical theory. And if we were Marcuse, we would have said is a liberating, uh, a, a liberating theory or something like that. That's it. And so the goal is to reform education to be about Marxism. That's it sounds this more robust understanding is to just turn education into Marxist programming. He says it also involves a commitment towards social transformation. So there's your theory wedded to praxis I just talked about. It involves a commitment towards social transformation and a break with the comforting illusions that the ways in which our societies and their educational apparatuses are organized currently can lead to social justice. So this we can hearken back. We can go right back to to Max Horkheimer saying when he originally conceived of the critical theory in the first place, why did he do it? He said because Marx Marx didn't have it right. He, he, he thought it would be possible to conceive of a better world in the terms of the existing world. And in fact, the critical theory throws out that assumption entirely. This is what Marcuse turns into the negative thinking. Everything has to be negative thinking. This is where Adorno says that the you cannot cast a positive image of the utopia. This is what it's all about. That you have to have a break from the comforting illusions that the ways in which our societies and our educational apparatuses are organized can even lead to social justice. So they're co-opting social justice as an idea out of anything that could be considered liberal or even normal progressive and turning it into this Marxist concept where social justice is actually the equivalent of communism across all neo-Marxist and identity axes of power. And you have to be committed in critical pedagogy to this. A more robust understanding, he says this again, a more robust understanding of critical education is also based in, which basically means that you have adopted their assumptions. You are in the Hegelian vernunft of critical pedagogy. You are a critical pedagogist. You are a critical theorist of education. A more robust understanding, in other words, a in the cult understanding of critical education becoming socialist man with, it, with regard to education as Marx might have it, is also based increasingly in a realization of the importance of multiple, and that's in italics, dynamics underpinning the relations of exploitation and domination in our societies. That's what I just was talking about with the neo-Marxist split from class, which is what Marx is all about, workers of the world unite, everything else is irrelevant, one unifying uh, axis to all the neo-Marxist axes, whether it's culture, whether it's class, whether it's race, whether it's immigration status, whether it's sex, whether it's gender, whether it's sexuality, whether it's ability status, whether it's fat status, whether it's mental health, whether it's vaccination status, all the way out into this multiple dynamics underpinning the relations of exploitation and domination, which is all Marxism thinks about. In other words, he's just saying we're doing Marxist theory applied across every possible social, cultural, and economic axis that we can imagine at the same time. And we're going to pretend that that's sophisticated instead of just uh, manipulative and confusing. And that's what it means to become one of these people. Hence, he says issues Surrounding the politics of redistribution, Marxism, exploitative economic processes and dynamics, he clarifies, and the politics of recognition, cultural struggles against domination and struggles over identity, he clarifies, need to be jointly considered. This is what I'm talking about with the fusion. What has he just said? Issues surrounding the politics of redistribution, classical Marxism, and the politics of recognition, postmodern Marxism, have to be blended together, need to be jointly considered, he says. So 
In other words, every damn thing I've said about this stuff is correct. You just have to be able to read their gobbledygook to understand it. Continuing, at the very root of these concerns are two simple principles. So I love when they simplify for us. First, we must think relationally. That's in italics, relationally. That is, he says, all of our institutions and sets of social relations and even our very identities need to be seen as intimately connected to the inequalities that structure our society and to the movements that seek to interrupt such inequalities. In other words, you are your politics. You need to understand that everything is political power. Everything must be understood in terms of those pagan gods of power dynamics, because it's Marxism. There's going to be a conflict, a, theory, a conflict theory applied to that that's going to be applied relationally. In other words, your relationship to those positions of power, they call it positionality, by the way, in intersectionality, and positionality, Robin D'Angelo instructs, must intentionally be engaged. You must constantly think of who you are against. Are you bourgeois or are you proletariat? Are you... Do you have access to whiteness or are you a racial minority who's excluded from it? Are you a model minority? You know, blah, 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 blah. And we must not only see this, he says, not only is who you are, your very identities, relevant to your positionality, but also, as he says, to the movements that seek to interrupt such inequalities. Why can't you be black and against critical race theory? Because you are misaligned with the movement that seeks to interrupt what critical race theory sees as the domination by race. That's why. And who you are, whether or not you are politically or racially black, as Nicole Hannah-Jones had it, who you are, even your very identity, needs to be seen as intimately connected to the inequalities that structure our society, Marxism, by identity Marxism, and to the movements that seek to interrupt such inequality. So you're either with us or you're not a person. You're not actually black. There's a difference between being racially and politically black. They say it explicitly. That's the first of the two principles at the root of all of the critical pedagogy concerns. Michael Apple tells us here, second, in order to understand and act on education and its complicated connections, they always want everything to be complicated. In order to understand and act on education in its complicated connections to the larger society, we must engage in the process of repositioning. It will be hard, but we should constantly try to see the world through the eyes of the dispossessed and act against the ideological and institutional processes and forms that reproduce oppressive conditions. In other words, you must become a critical theorist with respect to these factors of identity. And your goal is to constantly reposition yourself to think that way. This repositioning, again, remember, positionality must be intentionally engaged. This repositioning, the elevation of the oppressed over the so-called oppressor, according to the Marxian conflict theory, that's the point of class struggle is to point that out. That's just a reproduction of Marx all over again, but now with identity wrapped in and politics wrapped in, this repositioning concerns both political and cultural practices that embody the principles of critical education. But it also has a, has generated a large body of critical scholarship and theory, <laughs> podcasters know, aka garbage, that has led to a fundamental restructuring of what the roles of research and of the researcher are. So in other words, not research is going to be considered research for the purposes of being able to see also the grievance studies affair so that they can just forward their agenda with the appearance of legitimacy, which they think is more legitimate than true legitimacy because true legitimacy is stuck in Hegel's Verstand and they have Hegel's Vernunft. True legitimacy is based in actual knowledge, whereas uh, their idea of legitimacy is based in being a socialist man with a socialist, a scientific socialism under, informing everything. That's Marx. Theirs is ba- true legitimacy is based in traditional theory, but their version of le- of legitimacy is based in critical theory. Therefore, critical pedagogy as a critical theory of education falling out. You can see this is the most self serving intellectual swindle in the history of mankind it's just been reproducing itself since the 1840s when Marx first started writing it down, or even since 1807 when Phenomenology of Spirit came out with Hegel. Greatest intellectual swindle ever to where our farts 
are the true good smelling farts and they give us greater insight by smelling them constantly and each other's farts when they smell correctly like farts then we know uh, you know your fart smells like mimosas or something like that then we're in business that's all this is and this is a large body of bogus i mean critical scholarship and theory that has led to a fundamental restructuring through what Lyotard warned us about as a legitimation by paralogy a false view of consensus generated by false experts, namely critical theorists, producing false papers and false knowledge that people embrace as though they're real because smart people said them in smart words published in official journals. And it's led to a real fundamental restructuring of what the roles of research and the researcher are so that we now have a watered down research basis that's used to water down into into co-opt what education is about and who the educators are going to be, et cetera. So I hope I'm framing out what critical pedagogy as a project and the critical turn in education has really been about using Mr. Apple's, Dr. Apple probably his own words, to do it. He says, in my recent book, because he's got to pimp his own, Can Education Change Society, Apple 2013, I detail a number of tasks in which critical education research and critical scholar activists in education should engage. This is, I think, the meat of this forward, so I'm ex or introduction or whatever. So I'm excited to go through this. Many points of what he thinks is crucial for critical education research and critical scholar activists in education to do. Let me say more about what this implies. He says, since these tasks have major implications for the critical traditions with which Isaac Gottsman deals. So before I jump into this list. I'm going to just point out Gottsman here is mostly being a historian of this critical turn, though he's certainly ideologically aligned with it. Um, it is a self-believed winner attempting to write history, uh, or rewrite the history of the turn in education, but he is a good documentarian of what actually happened. That's why I think that you should go get this book and read it if you care about what's happened and is happening in our schools. But now we're going to turn, Gottsman is a historian, Apple is the ideologist here, and he's now relating back to his 2013 book, Can Education Change Society, which I'm sure we should also read. Um, and he wants to say what these commitments are. Uh, and Isaac Gottsman is, is kind of framing where all this happened, and that's kind of what he said there. So I don't really need to explain that, I guess. So... Point one, let me see how many of these are, there are. There are a bunch, um, nine. Okay, so we're going to go through these nine points uh, about what critical education research and critical scholar activists in education must engage. One, it must, quote, bear witness to negativity. You remember the whole thing I just said a minute ago about negative thinking with a critical tradition? Disrupt, dismantle, deconstruct, subvert, destroy, 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 break, break, break. It must bear witness to negativity. Remember that thing I said a minute ago about critical theory is that it holds an idealized vision for society and it explains how the existing society does not live up to that vision. And then it inspires social activism on behalf of changing that state of affairs. I didn't quote Marx yet, ruthless criticism of all that exists being one of his chief mottos. It must bear witness to negativity. Horkheimer. You cannot conceive of the good society in the terms of the existing society. We must, in fact, he goes on to say, we can, however, criticize the features of the existing society that don't live up to the idealized society. Marcusa, negative thinking becomes positive by its virtue of uh, revealing the, the potentially better society that is contained within the present society. That's an essay on liberation. It must bear witness to negativity. That's his first point. That is, one of its primary functions, critical education, one of its primary functions is to illuminate the ways in which educational policy and practice are connected to the relations of exploitation and domination and to struggles against such relations in the larger society. In other words, it must do Marxian conflict theory, which is bearing witness to negativity, which is complaining in a specialized way about everything you want to control until you control it. And here, what you're controlling is education, therefore children, therefore children's minds, therefore the next generation of the, of, of the country. Must bear witness to negativity. Two, in engaging in such critical analyses, bearing witness to negativity, in engaging in such critical analyses, 
it must also point to contradictions in spaces of possible action. That's all Marxist theory does. Point out the contradictions so that you can alienate people from the existing system, make them angry, uh, angry at it, and identify weaknesses for spaces of possible action. Look for places where you can stick that disgruntled lever in and break off a chunk of the existing society, break off a chunk of the wall holding up the existing society or whatever. Thus, he says, its aim is to critically examine current realities with a conceptual slash political framework that emphasizes the spaces in which more progressive and counter hegemonic actions can or do go on. So here we have an explicit call, not only to Marxian theory, but Gramscian uh, theory, uh, examine the current realities with a, what did I tell you? The point of a critical theory, idealize vision of society, complain about how the existing society doesn't live up to it, inspire social activism. In other words, space is a possible action that you can take to do it. This is straight up critical theory, basic, basic, basic. Why? So that you can find places to be more progressive and specifically counter hegemonic. So that's Gramsci. Gramsci said that the existing system has kind of a cultural force field that it puts out called hegemony. That's a form of kind of power that exists within the cultural milieu. And he says what you do to overcome that is you infiltrate the space and then you create a counter hegemony. You create a new consensus vision of what's supposed to be happening within the existing institution and have it kind of burst out. So the the this is Marcusa again, the, the idea of the idealized society is contained within the present society. And all you have to do is kind of firm, or foment that in the counter hegemonic push within the institution and then problematize the existing institution so that you tear off the existing uh, shape of the thing and replace it with the cordyceps mushroom uh, parasite fungus of critical theory growing out from the inside of it. And that's what Apple says is point two uh, is absolutely crucial to what critical education is about. Um, this, he says, in fact, is an absolutely crucial step, since otherwise our research can simply lead to cynicism or despair. Imagine that. Bearing constant witness to negativity could lead to cynicism or despair. But what keeps the communist going is that they're wrecking things and taking them over. As long as they are successful, this is a colonialist project. As long as they are successfully colonizing things with their counter-hegemonic actions... They are motivated and avoid cynicism and despair. This is why it's a religion, folks. Constant negativity. Well, how do they overcome that? By having a duty of conscience to constantly colonize and take things over. And when they fail, that means that it was still, you know, the same problems persisted and they can recolonize and have perpetual revolution within it. And that is the thing that gives them their relentless, you know, energy to continue going. And he says that's absolutely crucial absolutely crucial is to look for spaces of action, places where you can actually engage in ideological colonization of educational spaces and programs. That's literally what he's calling for as point number two, Marxism. In fact, using what we referred to in, in other episodes as entryism. Entryism is the, the process of establishing a, a counter hegemony by finding ways to enter into an existing institution and begin to purge out people who have the opposing viewpoint. This has obviously happened in education. This has obviously happened throughout academia. Uh, and we, we, we've talked, I think, in the, on the podcast before about how the defund the police movement, the goal of, or abolish the police or whatever, that p abolition movement is actually not to get rid of the police <laughs> or to defund them. It is to uh, abolish as Aufheben in German. So it is to remake them. And so the goal is actually to squeeze out you defund the police. Why? To fire a bunch of people, then you're going to have a crime. Well, you're going to first, that you're going to get rid of people, then you're going to change the policy to have a DEI hiring policy. Then you're going to have a crime wave crisis. Isn't that what's happening in our cities? And what are you going to have to do? And this is what's already starting to happen. You have to hire a bunch of new people to come in and be cops, but you're going to hire them with the ideological DEI program for hiring. So you're going to hire a secret police. It's, it's a program of replacing the police with a secret police. And here it's a program of replacing education with critical education, which is to say critical programming because it's cult programming. Okay. Point number three. At times, this also requires broadening of what counts as, quote, research, you know, like dog sex to overcome rape culture. Here, I mean acting as critical, quote, secretaries to those groups of people in social movements who are now engaged in challenging existing relations of unequal power. In other words, what he says is we have to broaden what counts as research to count critical theory as research, 
and we have to act as critical secretaries, he says, whatever that means, to those groups of people and social movements who are on their side. In other words, you have to facilitate the entryism as a form of praxis. You have to broaden what constitutes research, and you have to help people who are doing that. Henry Giroux, who has been mentioned already, famously bragged in one of his earlier books about how one of his pieces of, of, of early praxis, one of his great, uh, you know, feathers in his critical educator cap was in getting 100 tenured education faculty members who were critical pedagogists early on in the 1980s, a hundred of them. So that's what this is about, bringing in more of them into the program of education. Remember, it's just your children and the future generations and the future of the uh, civilization and country that are at stake. That's what these people are actually trying to infiltrate and take over and cause a revolution on the other side of which they control. No big deal. Point four, when Gramsci, 1971, guess whose version of the book he's citing? Joseph Buttigieg, translation of the prison notebooks. When Gramsci, 1971, argued that Gramsci, argued that one of the tasks of a truly counter-hegemonic education was not to throw out, quote, elite knowledge, but to reconstruct its form and content so that it served genuinely progressive social needs, aka Marxism, because they don't believe that anything else is genuinely progressive. He provided a key to another role of that, quote, organic, end quote, public intellectuals might play. Thus, we should not be engaged in a process of what might be called, quote, intellectual suicide. That is, there are serious intellectual and pedagogic skills in dealing with the histories and debates surrounding the epistemological, political, and educational issues involved in justifying what counts as important knowledge and what counts as an effective and socially just education. These are not simple and inconsequential issues and the practical and intellectual political skills of dealing with them have been well developed. However, they can atrophy if they are not used. We can give back these skills by employing them to assist communities in thinking about this, learning from them, and engaging in the mutually pedagogic dialogues that enable decisions to be made in terms of both the short-term and long-term interests of the dispossessed. All he's saying with this whole thing is that we is that, that critical educators absolutely need to co-opt what's considered elite knowledge to reconstruct its form and content so that it serves Marxism. And this isn't a intellectual exercise that puts them off into some backwater. This becomes what an organic or public intellectual is actually going to espouse. You're going to co-opt those people and you're going to frame everything out in terms of Marxism. Five. In the process, critical work has the task of keeping traditions of radical and progressive work alive. Not other traditions, not the traditions of the country that you're trying to subvert or destroy. Traditions of radical and progressive work have to be kept alive. In the face of organized attacks on the, quote, collective memories of difference and critical social movements, attacks that make, I guess that's what I'm doing here, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm fucking attacking you people. Uh, attacks that make it increasingly difficult to retain academics and social legitimacy from multiple critical approaches that have, that have proven so valuable in countering dominant narratives and relations. It is absolutely crucial that these traditions be kept alive, renewed, and when necessary, criticized for their conceptual, empirical, historical, and political silences or limitations. Constantly concentrate the ideology. And also, what he's saying is, that there is pushback. The critical pedagogy movement has not, the critical education movement has not gone perfectly smoothly. People at times have said, you know what? No, we're not going to give you tenure because you're a freaking radical. So what he's saying here is critical work has to encourage the radicalism. Radical and progressive work has to be kept alive. And so there's these organized attacks, namely, we don't want you weirdos, so we're not going to hire you. We're not going to publish your critical theory papers. Your critical theory of education is not in a, a, a proper theory of education. It's a crap critical theory. He says that these are attacks that make it difficult to retain academic and social legitimacy for critical approaches, which he then bogusly asserts are, are so valuable in doing what? Countering dominant narratives and relations. In other words, being dissident nonsense, um, being a critical theory. So he says it's in, the, in light of that, it's absolutely crucial these traditions be kept alive and renewed, blah, blah, blah. But they also have to concentrate themselves because of silences and limitations. 
This involves, he says, being cautious of reductionism and essentialism because, you know, real communism hasn't been tried and earlier approaches were too reductionist. That's, in fact, what Mark Lamont Hill said, if you recall, in my when he supposedly owned me on his show without realizing that I was exposing him. Um, he said that he would say that these movements are uh, actually it might have been when he was talking to Liz Wheeler, if I'm not mistaken, that he said that the characterization that uh, critical race theory is is racist or whatever is too re- or no is 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 just Marxism with race. He said that's too reductionist, right? This is exactly what happened. This involves being cautious of reductionism and essentialism. So they say they're being cautious of these things while they do them, of course, and asks us to pay attention to what Fraser has called both quote the politics of redistribution and the politics of recognition. So Marxism and postmodernism sort of in a sense, or the identity, identity Marxism. So you have the economic material side and the identity sides, redistribution, economic redistribution and recognition. That's redistribution of privilege where redistribution refers to redistribution of material resources, Marxism in two frames at once. That's all he's talking about. This includes not only keeping theoretical, empirical, historical, and political traditions alive, but very importantly, extending and supportively criticizing them. Constantly concentrate the critical methodology within critical theory. Always strengthen the faith. It also involves keeping alive the dreams, utopian visions, and, quote, non-reformist reforms that are so much a part of these radical traditions. Utopian visions. There it is. Dreams, utopian visions, and non-reformist reforms. How about that? A nice contradictory idea that means that they get to have power because they get to define what it means because a non-reformist reform by definition doesn't mean anything. So it gets to mean whatever they say it gets to mean, which means they get to have the power to decide what it means and the power to implement it. So they can get their literally utopian vision. What did I say was a critical theory again? What was it? Oh, yeah. As an idealized, or in other words, utopian vision for society. It complains about how the existing society doesn't live up to that vision. It inspires social activism on behalf of achieving that vision. Ding, ding, ding. Six. Keeping such traditions alive and also supportively criticizing them when they are not adequate to deal with current realities cannot be done unless we ask, for whom are we keeping them alive and how and in what form are they to be made available? All of these things that I have mentioned above in this taxonomy of tasks requires the relearning or development and use of varied or new skills of working at many levels with multiple groups. Complexity, 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 which serves them, and it's all fake. But really what this all boils down to is their crap is going to fail because it's garbage. It's crap. It's going to fail. And what's going to happen is they're going to say it was ins- it was too reductionist. It was ins- it was too mechanical. It was insufficiently attuned to this other more complex nuanced variable. We could go back in time to kind of see what's happening here with another failed theory, which is the geocentric model of the solar system. The earth is at the center and everything, including the sun, goes around the earth. And what what they were looking at in the pre-Copernican model with a geocentric model, what they were looking at was they were trying to figure out, they're watching the planets move around in the sky. Planet, by the way, if you don't know, derives from the the, the Latin word for, for wanderer because uh, the planets seem to wander al- along in the sky. They also all follow this line called the uh, called the ecliptic that the sun moves on as well. And so you have these wanderers and they kind of they're always very close to the ecliptic and they move kind of across the sky. All the other stars are fixed relative to one another. You know, Orion always looks like Orion. The Big Dipper always looks like Big Dipper. It might move around the pole star in terms of where it is in the sky at different times of both day and year. Technically, that's the same thing. But um, in terms of what's visible changes, but they they move may move around in that regard, but the stars do, but they're fixed in relationship to one another. The planet's not so, you know, the planet might be in, it's not in the Big Dipper, a planet might be in say like uh, Taurus and then later it's in Pisces, uh, two different constellations. The stars in Taurus don't move rel- rel- uh, relative to one another. The stars in Pisces don't move relative to one another, but Jupiter does and it might go through both of them at different times. And so it's wandering through the sky. So they're watching the planets wander. And then as many people have heard, that wandering motion of the planets 
has sometimes what they call retrograde motion. So it looks like, you know, they're, the planet is going, it's going, it's going, it's tracking across the night sky, one constellation to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other. Then all of a sudden it slows down and it loops around a little bit and it seems to backtrack. And if you draw, you know, a star map and here's say Taurus and here's say Pisces or Gemini or whatever, and it, it you know, Jupiter moves from one to the other. And then all of a sudden it slows down and it wheels back a little bit and it goes backwards. It's retrograde motion as a wanderer. And then it wheels around again and it goes forward again, but it has this little loop. And so, so planetary theorists thought of this idea called epicycles. They said what was going on because it was, you know, God's perfect vision of the solar system. So the earth's at the center and everything goes around the earth in circular orbits. Turns out all of this is wrong. Um, the orbits are ellipses and then Kepler, Kepler's law will tell you how that works. But uh, they said that there's these circular orbits. And so when you have that circular orbit and you start looking at it, no, the wandering planet should just wander in a straight straight line along the ecliptic, but it actually wobbles off the ecliptic and it goes retrograde and it goes back. So what they said was, oh, well, everything must be perfect. You have the circular orbit. Jupiter's on a circular orbit around the earth, but on its own orbit, it's going in its own little circle. And they call that an epicycle. And so when Jupiter's going forward, uh, or in the same direction, you know, it's going around the earth in some direction. When it's going forward on its little circle relative to that direction, then it looks like it's going a little faster. But when it's going backwards, it might actually track backwards in the sky. And then it's going to loop back around and go forward again at some point. And so they, they, they came up with this idea of epicycles. And the epicycles, the math just never worked out. And there's all this interesting history. I don't want to get into Tycho Brahe and, and Copernicus and, and all of these things. But there's all this kind of interesting, and Kepler, all this interesting stuff was going on in the 16th century, figuring out that the epicycle model was just wrong. And at one point, it w they were trying to reconcile the data that they were observing they're looking at the planets and they're like, well, a simple circle doesn't work. And so they put uh, Jupiter isn't just going on a little circle on its circular orbit. It's now going on a little circle on its little circle on its circular orbit. So epicycles upon epicycles. Turns out that if you understand how I think it's a Fourier transform works, that eventually if you put enough circles like that, they could actually get it exactly right. But it, this is this is a failure of what scientists call parsimonious explanation. And so when you suddenly switch from the geocentric model over to the heliocentric model, you put the sun at the center, what you realize is there's not a little circle on a little circle on the orbit or something like this, epicycle on an epicycle on a cycle. There is instead that sometimes the Earth, which is inside the orbit of Jupiter, goes is moving and it, it passes Jupiter. Jupiter's trucking along, the Earth is catching up to it relative in the orbit, and it, relatively speaking, passes Jupiter, and it's, you know, if we set a particular angle out of the sun, it catches up and passes Jupiter. And when it does, it looks like Jupiter's going backwards, and as Earth goes around, it again starts to look like Jupiter goes forward. So it turns out that if you actually get this right and you put the sun at the center, you actually solve this problem much, much more cleanly. And then they realized that this still didn't match up quite right, but it was way better. And then Kepler comes along and figures out his universal laws of planetary motion and uh, based off of Newton. And off we go. Now we understand that the orbits are actually elliptical and we're doing a lot better. And so there's a huge diversion to point out that what's going on here is that the critical theorists crap fails. And so rather than saying we are doing something wrong by putting critical theory at the center of the universe, what they're doing instead is saying, no, no, the failed institution must have a little circle on its orbit. It must have an epicycle that it's going around. And, oh, and that, that didn't work either. The theory it needs to be nuanced further. So let's put a circle on the circle on the circle. And they believe that if they get out far enough that they're going to have the best explanation possible because it's rooted in critical theory, which is wrong in the first place. And uh, that if they can approximate with enough nuance, basically they're going to achieve the equivalent of the complicated Fourier transform and they're going to be able to get this thing. Mm, there we go. That's what's actually going on. What this is, is the attempt to rescue a failed theory and to say something like real communism has never been tried. And they're just doing it again and again. So keeping such traditions alive, six, he says, and also supportively criticizing them when they're not adequate to deal with current realities. In other words, adding epicycles cannot be done unless we ask for whom are we keeping them alive? So social relations and how and in what form are they to be made available? 
And of course, the answer to that question is going to be through critical theory. All of the things he said that I mentioned above in this taxonomy of tasks required their relearning or development and use of varied or new skills of working at many levels with multiple groups, thus journalistic and media skills, epicycle, academic and popular skills, circle on a circle, the ability to speak to very different audiences, circle on a circle on a circle, are increasingly crucial. This requires us to learn how to speak in different registers and to say important things in ways that do not require the audience or reader to do all of the work. Speaking in different registers, by the way, that means the words mean two things at once. That's the the abusive language, abusive power trick at the heart of all this critical theory, where even the word critical means two things at once and multiple things at once. The word race means multiple things at once. The word theory means multiple things at once. Seven, critical educators must also act in italics. All he's doing is revamping critical theory. Did you pick pick that up yet? Now we're at point number three. Critical educators must also act in concert with the progressive social movements their work supports, or in movements against the rightist assumptions and policies that they critically analyze. In other words, critical educators must support Marxist movements and oppose anything that opposes Marxist movements which are rightist assumptions. Just like every Marxist in history has ever said about everything that disagrees with them, it's not wrong, it's rightism. Kind of like the the mirror image of leftism. This is another reason that scholarship and critical education implies becoming an, quote, organic or, quote, public intellectual. One must participate in and give one's expertise to movements surrounding actions to transform both politics, a politics of redistribution and a politics of recognition. We've already talked about politics of redistribution. That's the materialist side and politics of recognition. That's the cultural side. So you've got to have a kind of materialist Marxism and a cultural Marxism blending together. And you must participate in these movements and lend one's expertise. That's what it means to be a public intellectual. Everybody wants to be a public intellectual in these spaces, right? Everybody wants to be Sam Harris. We want to be a public intellectual. What it means, though, is to qualify as an organic or public intellectual is to support these Marxist movements. He says it also implies learning from these social movements. This means that the role of the, quote, unattached intelligentsia, someone who, quote, lives on the balcony, is not an appropriate model. You have to be an activist. You can't just be a scholar who studies in a detached way what's going on in the world. You must become an activist. In other words, you must put your conclusion ahead of your uh, inquiry. You can't be the unattached intelligentsia who lives on the balcony. This is very postmodern, but I said that right before he invokes Bourdieu, who was a French sociologist, who Pierre Bourdieu, who was not a big fan of postmodernism, but basically reproduced a lot of the, a lot of similar ideas. He was not a fan of Foucault and Derrida, though, for example. As Bourdieu reminds us, for example, our intellectual efforts are crucial, but they, quote, cannot stand aside neutral and indifferent from the struggles in which the future of the world is at stake. Wow, that's extreme. That escalated quickly, didn't it? The future of the world is at stake. We cannot stand aside from the struggles. Well, if you want to get the right answers, you damn well better. You better step back and stop thinking you know the right answer to how you're going to, that's Gnosticism, by the way, how you're going to restructure the world so that you can, uh, the future of the world is at stake. So dramatic, so hyperbolic, but, uh, and that's Pierre Bourdieu speaking there. So intellectual efforts must be activist efforts first. They must adopt an idealized vision for society identify how the existing society fails to live up to that vision and inspire and in fact engage in social activism on behalf of those movements. Here it is explicitly literally step seven or task seven, eight. Building on the points made in the previous paragraph, the critical scholar activist, again, scholar activist that's appeared once. I didn't pause to highlight it with lots of flourish, but that's exactly what we were talking about in cynical theories that Scholar and thus research, just like we heard in some of these other points, has been redefined to be scholar activist. The activism must be part of it. That's what the previous point was about with the Burdu quote. The activism must be a part of your scholarship. The activist agenda must be part of what's constituted as research. So we must broaden the definition of research and reconstitute fundamentally what we mean by research. Do you see how all this actually comes together to a very simple articulation that it's the Marxists are always right and everybody else must be marginalized? That's all they're saying. It says 
deep as a mud puddle, I'm telling you. But anyway, building on the points made in the previous paragraph, the critical scholar activist has another role to play. She or he (laughs) needs to act as a deeply committed mentor, as someone who demonstrates through her or his (laughs) life what it means to be both an excellent researcher and a committed member of a society that is scarred by persistent inequalities. So dramatic. Scarred by persistent inequalities. You must always think of yourself as scarred by persistent inequalities, and that's going to has to go right alongside being a so-called excellent researcher, even though that's exactly the kind of grievance that prevents you from being an excellent researcher because your vision and in, in, in view and in, in objectivity are all clouded, which is why they want to obliterate objectivity, because it has to be based on subjectivity, which is what it means to be a committed member of a society that is scarred by persistent inequalities. She or he (laughs) needs to show how one can blend these two roles together, dialectically one might say, blend these two roles together in ways that may be tense, but still embody the dual commitments to exceptional and socially committed research and participating in movements whose aim is interrupting dominance. So the dialectical fusion of scholarship and activism in ways, uh, blend the roles together in ways that may be tense, but still embody the dual commitments to exceptional and socially committed research. Do you see what they're saying? Everything must be reframed to become what Marx would have called, if it was just old school Marx, socialist science. Everything must be reframed, and the only people who understand it are socialist man. In other words, people who are, in the more updated terminology, critical theorists, who are doing not just traditional theory, but critical theory. It should be obvious, he says, that this must be fully integrated into one's teaching as well. Nine. Finally, participation also means using the privilege one has as a scholar activist. Of course. So you must constantly concentrate the faith within yourself. You must recognize the fact that you have privilege, and you're going to put that privilege that you have, that position of power and influence that you have as an educator to use to indoctrinate more or program more people. Participation also means using the privilege one has as a scholar activist. That is, Each of us needs to make use of one's privilege to open the spaces at universities and elsewhere for those who are not there, for those who do not now have a voice in that space and in the professional, quote, professional sites to which being in a privileged position, you have access. Very religious in in its orientation. You kind of constantly have to minister and try to open up the the church through this kind of uh, space to allow the the disaffected in. Uh, you know why? So you can re- so you can program them to become critical theorists. This is whether you look at Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, with their education of the peasants, whether you look at the uh, Long March of the Institutions um, lens, uh, and is based off of Mao and Gramsci. You have. Exactly that. It's constantly bringing more radicals, more dissidents into education as part of into into the colleges and universities, into positions as teachers and professionals. Constantly bring the radicals in. So you, you might be put in mind of that feminism or women's studies, I should say, as a virus paper by Brian Foz and Michael Carger that I've read here on the podcast as well, where they said the point, uh, the metaphor of the virus is that you're going to take students and they give the example of biology students. You're going to take students and you're going to make them take women's studies classes as part of their educational program. And then they're going to get women's studies in and they graduate their degree in biology, but a minor, say, in women's studies. And then they're going to go in and infect a biology department. By creating biology department shouldn't have space for women's studies because it's Marxist crap. But now you're going to infect it from the inside. You're going to create more room and space, and you're going to use your privilege as somebody who graduated to do that. And as an administrator, as a department head, you're going to use your privilege. You're going to get your thumb screws being twisted there, but your moral obligation. You're going to use your privilege as a department head or a dean to allow that ideological subversion of your discipline to happen or your department to happen. That's what's being instructed here as point nine. So the constant viral or parasitic or fungal spread of the ideology is point number nine. Marxism, Marxism, Marxism. 
Continuing with Mr. Apple out of these nine points, let us be honest. These are difficult tasks, and it will undoubtedly be hard for each of us to be fully successful in all of them. Instead, these are both individual and collective responsibilities. Both individual and collective, so we have to hold each other accountable. Accountability is going to be key. Ones that critical education has struggled with for a long time. The critical turn in education, uh, referring to the book, not the historical uh, fact that it documents, the critical turn in education examines the ways in which the traditions within critical education have sought to come to grips with a number of these tasks. It also points to what needs to be done in the future to take them even more seriously, constant concentration of the ideology. Through a series of detailed analyses of key figures and movements, Isaac Gotsman provides us with a nuanced and clear picture of the development of many of the major issues in critical education theory and research. He documents the increasing sophistication of the field. Remember what that means? More epicycles. From its early emphasis on education as only a mechanism of class and economic reproduction, in other words, Marxist analysis, Marxist education theory, to its attention to education as a site of resistance, so now we're in neo-Marxist education theory, as an arena of ideological conflict and its role in the production of complex identities and movements, so now we're in kind of postmodern identity Marxism in education, and as an area that has both limits and possibilities in the long-term struggles to build a more just, meaning communist, society. At the same time, he details the ways in which what started out as powerful critique of the relationship between education and class dynamics has been challenged and reconstituted around not only class, but race, gender, sexuality, and the intersections of each of these. So if you heard my recent podcast here on New Discourses about the rise, I think there are two of them actually, the rise of identity Marxism, you just heard what I was talking about, from class to identity politics. So the quick summary of that is Marxism didn't work, so they invented cultural Marxism, cultural Marxism didn't work, so neo-Marxism grew out as a more epicycle laden, aka sophisticated uh, approach to the, to the cultural critique. That shifted at the end of the 1960s to identity Marxism, where the identity uh, line became the interesting spot to find the proletariat. And then after postmodernism came in and characterized, say, racial groups as cultures, you have a kind of cultural identity Marxism that represents what wokeness is. Wokeness is cultural identity Marxism. Critical race theory is the race Marxism component within that, just to kind of frame this out. But we have race well, that's in quotes, by the way, class, but quote, race, gender, sexuality, and the intersections of each of these. In this way, increasingly both structural and post-structural approaches, this is the fusion of neo-Marxism and postmodernism that I've said is at the core of what's going on with critical constructivism, which is at the heart of this, by the way, the, words, the term critical constructivism, which I've referred to many times as with the true academic description of what Peterson called postmodern neo-Marxism, which we all call woke. Critical constructivism was named by an education theorist named Joe Kinchelow who uh, died a number of years ago, but who is very instrumental in bringing all this about. And so this is saying this, that's how I figured out what was going on here. Increasingly, both structural and post-structural approaches have come to exist. And this is going to be structural in the Marxian sense, if we're going to refer back to my Mark Lamont Hill thing, superstructures of society, uh, but not necessarily nearly as much in the kind of um, Sacher, uh, Louis Althusser, uh, structuralist approach that actually derives out of existentialism, that derives out of romanticism, that derives out of uh, Rousseau and the French line toward postmodernism as it got infected with Marxist leftism as it went along and then fell out of that. Um, increasingly, both structural, Marxist structural, and post-structural, which is what the postmodernists brought to this table, have come to exist in a sometimes tense but also very productive relationship with one another. What did I tell you? They are dialectically fused. That's what happened in the 90s when we called it applied postmodernism in cynical theories, what Jordan Peterson called postmodern neo-Marxism, what is technically called critical constructivism, and I've talked about that extensively, came into a, what does he say? come in a sometimes tense but also very productive relationship with one another, a dialectical relationship with one another, dialectical synthesis of with one another, which is exactly what I said is the deal. And structural, so that's your Marxist, neo-Marxist axis, and post-structural, that's your postmodern axis, have come to exist in a dialectically synthesized tense but also very productive relationship with one another.
a relationship that I certainly support, says Michael Apple. Class theories, post-structural feminist approaches, critical race theory are all treated with respect in this book. Concepts such as the hidden curriculum, that's a Marxist idea that in addition to the actual curriculum, you're actually teaching the values of society as a hidden curriculum, aghast, but that's the point of what they want to disrupt. So concepts such as the hidden curriculum, hegemony and counter-hegemony, so there's your Gramsci, critical pedagogy, white supremacy, and many more are all set in their historical context and the ongoing debates in a field that is always in motion because it's a perpetual revolution, perpetual revolutionary thing. Now, I recently did this on my Only Subs podcast, and I've said it before, but I'm going to make it really clear. Revolution is a two, has, has two meanings here, two valence uh, term. On the one hand, there's what we usually mean by revolution, and you're going to hear how this works within the concept of revolution in the sense of going around and around and around. So the broadly Hegelian view, all of this is the dialectical, it's just modifications on Hegel's dialectic. It's all bad. This is all a dialectical religion. We covered that ex in extensive detail in the Hegel podcast. Hegel believed that there was the absolute idea. The absolute idea gives for birth to nature and in particular the state. His exact statement was that the state is the divine idea as it exists on earth. And that gives birth as a, that gives a structure to society. There's Marx's superstructure that gives the, the, the state does. And that gives birth to a spirit of uh, the people, a geist, which is really in a sense a, a broadly, very broadly construed cultural milieu in which they're in. And what the, the theory there is, so there's your, your holy trinity, by the way, God, the, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Um, so the, the theory for Hegel, his theology, is that the idea as the, the Father gives birth to the state as the Son, which inspires the Spirit within the people, and that everything contains its own contradiction. And so over time, those contradictions build up and build up and build up within the people under that structure, that superstructural state that's caused by the prevailing idea of the time. And then it finally bursts through when the contradictions become untenable, unbearable any longer, and a real revolution occurs. And in the process, a new idea is instantiated. And that new idea gives rise after that revolution to a new state. Do you not see how this is what Marx's goal is? That's what the dictatorship of the proletariat is about. You build up and build up and build up till you get a revolution, which brings you in revolution around this dialectical circle back to a new idea that he would call socialism. And that's going to give rise to a new state, which is a dictatorship of the proletariat, which eventually in their view is going to through successive round and round and round and rounds going to finally actualize the, uh, the idea to perfection. And at which point communism and the perfected state and the revolution stops at the end of history. So you have this revolution going around and around and around that at its crucial point involves a political revolution. And then you have a new round around the revolution of the circle till you get a, so a new idea leads to a new state that leads to a new spirit that eventually can't stand its contradictions. Marx even said the contradictions build up and it's at the moment when they hit a certain point that that's where everything splits and there's a actual revolution. Marx had a better exposition of it, and I can't remember what it is off the top of my head without reading it again, so I'll have to come back to that at another point. And then you have a real revolution, a new idea, a new state arising from that new idea, and a new culture that eventually revolts, and again and again. And their goal, if you read Ferrari, in fact, he says that perpetual revolution is the only authentic revolution, and a revolution is meaning two things here, because anything that become any revolution that becomes static becomes the status quo. So you constantly have to be going around this. So why did I go into all of that just now? Concepts such as the hidden curriculum, hege hegemony and counter hegemony, critical pedagogy, white supremacy, and many more are all set in their historical context and the ongoing debates in a field that is always in motion. Remember, we started this forward with a story that by bringing critical pedagogy into standardized testing in professional education uh, spaces, education of educators, 
uh, then maybe that revolutionary perpetual motion thing was going to get lost. You were going to academicize, academicize the political rather than politicize the academic. And so that constant motion is central. And what does he say next? The idea of motion is significant here. Gottsman himself is deeply committed to the multiple critical projects that are associated with these traditions, but he also realizes that this is an unfinished set of projects. Or in Robin D'Angelo's world, words, no one has ever done. Um, you never actually get to the utopia, right? These traditions are indeed in constant motion, driven by transformations in the political, economic, ideological, and cultural dynamics and social movements of the larger society. The ideological, there's your idea. Political, economic, there's your material. So there's your state. And cultural and dynamics and social movements, there's your geist of the larger society. And by the continual internal criticisms and debates, the contradictions becoming unbearable that are so essential to progressive scholarship and action. But Gottsman doesn't limit himself to describing the development of the theories and debates that characterize the critical turn in education. Though that in itself is a significant contribution made by this book, he also points to the future. He articulates a set of cautions and suggestions that will undoubtedly strengthen the continued development of a robust, robust set of critical traditions and make them more influential actors in the public arena. It is my hope that Isaac Gottsman's efforts here will provide an impetus for others to engage in the detailed historical work so essential to remind us of how our past shapes who we are. That's, of course, Marx's theory that, and Hegel's, in fact, that history is basically everything. In fact, history is their deity in this religion. And it also reminds us that as long as the society in which we live creates relations of dominance and subordination and the contradictions and necessitates struggles against these relations, in other words, Marxian conflict theory, critical education will necessarily remain an unfinished but absolutely essential set of projects. Michael W. Apple, John Bascom, professor of curriculum and instruction in educational policy studies, University of Wisconsin, Madison. So that's the foreword to this book. What you therefore can take from this and the beginning salvo in this series on critical pedagogy that I want to do here on New Discourses is that the critical turn in education represents a turn to not just Marxist education, which we can we could stop there. That's enough. But this is actually, I want to relate this back to my most recent podcast here, which is the one I did on my, about theology, about the necessity of theology reaching back into John Henry Newman's idea of the university. What this is, is a theological move into the schools where the theology is Hegel's dialectical theology as translated through these various Marxist traditions. So Hegel to young Hegelians, I've done this in detail before, to Marx, from Marx to the cultural Marxists, to the neo-Marxists who are modified cultural Marxists, to the identity Marxists, to the cultural identity Marxists that we call woke, that have adopted post-structuralism and postmodernism as part of their milieu so that they're now looking not just at materialism, but also the cultural side of the politics of recognition, um, which in the, the critical race theory and introduction book by Delgado and Stefanczyk, they say is the tension between materialism and idealism and that the tension between those two dialectical synthesis is what's driving many of the discussions within critical race theory, etc. So what we are actually witnessing here is in the atrophy of a theological basis. And I advocate for no particular theology, no particular church, I think should have any purchase on education, but in the over secularization of our colleges of education and of our schools in the regard that there's no there's no mature science of meaning that's what i said in the previous podcast that a theology is a mature science of meaning there's no fundamental relationship between epistemology which is a theory of knowledge ontology which is a theory of being axiology which is a theory of values and i should have added sociology which is a theory of community that there's without a robust basis in that this thing this hegelian theology has filled in the gap by posing as being secular when it is in fact profoundly not secular it is in fact a gnostic religion that has been the critical turn in education is the introduction of this modern and postmodern, aka scientific Gnostic religion 
as a core theology behind the entire educational program. So what you're producing then are more or less worthless religious nut jobs out of students who can't read, who can't write, who can't do mathematics, who don't understand science, who don't understand the world around them, but they know how to complain about the world not being the way that they can imagine it being, if they imagine and reimagine and so on, and who are agitated enough and alienated enough by this failure of their education program to adopt this theology which requires them to become evangelists and social activists on its behalf. So what we have is a theological takeover by a nasty, nasty theology being described here. And that theology is ultimately what we should should refer to as dialectical leftism, which you can blame Kant if you want, but it really begins. You can also blame Rousseau. It really should, we should blame Rousseau because it's Rousseau's uh, musings on what is now called the master-slave dialectic that Schiller picked up and that Schiller taught to Hegel and that Hegel was so mystified by that led to he- Hegel coming up with this whole crap systematic philosophy. So we can blame Rousseau really for most of almost all of this. Um, both veins, like he gives off what becomes Hegelianism, which becomes Marxism, which young Hegelianism, which becomes Marxism, neo-Marxism, or cultural neo-Marxism to identity Marxism. But the identity Marxism kind of comes full circle by his other vein, which is the other aspects of Rousseau's thought, which inspired first the French Revolution, but then which was not so good uh, and involved a great reset and a year zero and a new calendar and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and a, a committee on public safety being the thing that drove it, but it also inspired romanticism in which sincerity, uh, and sentimentalism become arbiters, greater arbiters of truth than, than epistemology, the rigorous epistemologies like empiricism and logic. Uh, and then that inspires structuralism and then the post-structuralism and then postmodernism. And they fuse back together these two Rousseauian lines into this crap sh- crap hole that we have that's like updated. Basically, woke is just updated Rousseau through those two channels that took their own paths and reunited into a nightmare. Um, and what this ultimately boils down to, though, is especially through the Hegelian branch that we have a very, very robust revolutionary theology that does not see, if you want to be theological about it, it doesn't see God as a eternal transcendent being that is. It sees God as a process that becomes and that human beings through their thought processes are what make that God become. The idea becomes perfected by successively going around and around that revolutionary circle. That's the theology. That's the catechism of the dialectic. And what's being installed through the critical turn in education is to remake our educational system into a religious theological educational program at every single level with this theology rather than say a Christian theology, or if we were somebody else, we could be Buddhist or Muslim or whatever else theology. It is to install a Hegelian dialectical leftist religion as the heart of schooling. And as this forward indicates so far, uh, this has been a resoundingly successful project in North America for the Marxists. And hopefully through the rest of this series, we're going to start to uncover how badly <laughs> this is. First, how this happened. Secondly, how bad and deep it is, as I think Christopher Hitchens had it, you know, how deeply the termites have 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 delved and how how richly they've dined on the fundamental wooden infrastructure of our society at the site of education. Um, and so hopefully this, this has shed a lot of light on what's happened in our educational system, why it is essential for us to take back education from these critical pedagogists, how huge, I think one thing that this series is going to expose, cause I was reading this book again recently and it just overwhelmed me all over again is just how big and how old a problem this is. Uh, This has been going on a very long time and it has really spread throughout every, it's tendrils. It's it's not even, it's tendrils have filled every aspect of our educational and education of education programs or teaching colleges. It is that they have, the counter hegemony there is fully developed. There is no other it is the new hegemony. They have actually taken over education. So conservatives listening to this, think for five seconds. I know you want to get get on with your lives. You have better things to do. You want to like do your jobs. You want to do your business. You want to hang out with your family. You want to go to church. You want to live your life. Conservatives have ceded, at least for 40 years, but really for 50 years, they have ceded the educational space entirely to these leftist lunatics 
And this is what's happening in America now is exactly what happens when you do that. I don't know how true it is that they say politics is downstream from culture, but I do know that culture is downstream from education. Uh, that's absolutely certain. Culture is very downstream from education. And if you are going to seed that space to activists who want to fundamentally transform it into an ideological project on their behalf, you are going to end up with a ideologically prepared and groomed society two generations deep, millennials and half of the Zoomers or more, who are unable to think about the world any other way, who are then ripe for foisting a cultural revolution. So George Floyd died and our cultural revolution started in earnest. I guess it really started when Trump got elected. They went full blast at that point. But we are in the midst of the American cultural revolution. It is a direct parallel to the Chinese cultural revolution that Mao did from 66 to 76. And historians will be able to supposing we get out of this document when that actually started and how it should be characterized. Maybe my work will help them do that. I don't know. But that's what we're in. And the reason we're in it is because conservatives gave away education 40 and 50 years ago to leftist lunatics. How did this happen? Well, over the course of the series, we should find that out. But one element, one last element I'll add that's been very popular on social media lately as uh, more and more people are digging into this is that the very radical new left and this will segue into the next podcast uh, on this series, the radical new left, which was the weather underground, for example, very specifically, Bill Ayers, uh, what is it, Bernadine Dorn, is that her name? Uh, when, when these radical outsiders, literal terrorists, realized that their literal terrorism wasn't very popular and wasn't going to achieve their revolution, leading Herbert Marcuse to flip out and write counter-revolution and revolt in, in 1972, they all went into K-12 through activism and basically laid the paving stones for these educational theorists to be able to come in and get these materials at the center of education throughout North America. So we must understand what's happened here, how that's happened, how integral the NEA, the, the Teachers Union, the National Education Association has been from the beginning of the 1970s in uh, facilitating this project that the radicals of the 1960s who were so dangerous became the people who paved the way for this to come in. This is the big picture. I'm hoping that this will be helpful for people to understand that. Thanks for paying attention to episode one of a long series of Critical Pedagogy. The Critical Turn in Education is the book. That's the, I guess, broad title of the series. Um, stay tuned for many more episodes as we break all of this down.